Okay, time dependence. So, so far in this lecture course we were looking at stationary things. We were looking at ground state energies, we were looking at ground state properties, we were optimizing geometries into their zero Kelvin ground states of the corresponding molecules. So, in a way, we either had a stationary situation or we were on our way to stationary situations through some chain of other stationary situations. Uh, of course, real quantum mechanics is time dependent, and there are two kinds of time dependences there that are perhaps summarizing the state of the art. One is the time dependence of the entire system, including electronic degrees of freedom, so the motion of the electrons inside molecules and various associated phenomena. And second is the dynamics of the nuclei in the instantaneous ground state, but computed not with the Newtonian molecular dynamics that we have seen so far, but with accurate quantum mechanical forces. And, well, this is what we're going to be doing today. So, starting with the time-dependent electronic structure theory, uh, and with time-dependent DFT, because this is something that you will likely encounter if you need some excitation energies in large molecules, because pretty much today this is the only technique that is at the same time accurate and fast. But as we'll see, there are a few caveats, many of which have thankfully been solved by now. So if you remember some of the previous lectures, we had our hohenberg quan theorem in DFT, which said that the potential in which the system evolves is linked uh, uniquely in a bijective fashion to the electron density in the system. And I only sketched the proof, I didn't actually give it in general, but this is the fundamental rationale for DFT, that there's a one-to-one -one relationship there between the potential and the density. There is a generalization of that, um, quite remarkably, really, two time dependent situation. And the runge gross theorem states that there exists a similar one-to-one -one mapping between the time-dependent density of the system and the time-dependent potential in which the system evolves. And so it is possible to recast not just uh, stationary state quantum mechanics of electronic structure in terms of electron density alone, but it's also possible to recast the full dynamics and dynamical quantum mechanics of the system in terms of the dynamics of that three-dimensional electron density. And again, it yields the same kind of time savings in that we no longer have to deal with high-dimensional wave functions, but can instead deal with three-dimensional electron density uh, at the cost of introducing various obscure terms uh, like the exchange correlation function. Uh, and well, for DFT, uh, just like we had in quantum theory, in quantum theory, we had uh, psi t, observable psi t was returning us the time dependent observable. Uh, there would be a functional in DFT, which would be a functional of the time dependent electron density, which would return the same observable. Uh, and those functionals, as you can probably guess, uh, are not all exactly known at the time. Some are, some aren't. And this situation where we had our energy which was the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics, and then when we moved to, to, to time-independent DFT, it was a function of the electron density. What we now have is this energy minimum principle is replaced by the principle of the minimum action. Yes. So those of you who did Lagrangian mechanics uh, in the undergraduate courses will remember this thing called the action. And this is really, in quantum mechanics, this is just the Schrodinger equation. And if the Schrodinger equation is obeyed, this integral is supposed to be zero. Because really this is the left-hand side, and it was the right-hand side, which is subtracting. And so the task of finding a solution to Schrodinger equation, much like it was in classical mechanics, was the task of minimizing the action. And so now what we say is, instead of our usual Lagrangian action, what we will have is action function, which will return the action from, this time, our three-dimensional density, rather than our wave function. Again, it is utterly unclear uh, what the functional form of A would be, 
But this ring across here assures us that it does in fact exist. Right, so how do we proceed to do it computationally? Of course, uh, we don't want to have the integral differential equations in the system because digital computer can only really properly fast manipulate discretized systems, so vectors. So what we do is much like we did in Hartree-Fox theory and then in DFT, we introduce a complete system of functions. Those would be Gaussians or plane waves or whichever basis that you have actually chosen. Then the absolute squares would be the corresponding densities. Uh, and the sum total of all densities of each electron would be the total electron density. What this achieves in practice is it transforms integral differential equations into matrix equations with the dimension equal to the dimension of the basis. And so what we do, the modification that we introduce is, whereas previously in both Quanshan theory and the Hartree-Fox theory, those functions were time independent, we now make them time dependent, but with the condition that the time dependence preserves their orthogonality. And then the time dependent density will have a similar expansion in terms of time dependent orbitals. Right? And then, well, the potential was the external potential, the Coulomb potential, and the exchange correlation potential in the usual TFT. Uh, what it becomes is the external potential, then the Coulomb potential, and then the functional derivative of the exchange correlation action, rather than the exchange correlation energy. Uh, and then, well, we say that the Quanshan orbitals will obey a Schrodinger-like equation with the effective DFT Hamiltonian, which can be obtained by integrating uh, the various parts in there. Now, of course, the task of solving this in the time domain is formidable. And it is, in fact, very infrequently that people try solving either DFT or Hartree for forward in time for the electronic structure. They usually are looking for various responses. So linear response to perturbation, quadratic response to perturbation. And those are really a couple of first terms in the Taylor series in the solutions of these equations. Uh, and so it is rather infrequent that you see a full electronic structure being propagated forward in time. Uh, except in some high-intensity laser applications. Uh, but rather what people are interested in is seeing first, second, and so on, order response to perturbations of this Hamiltonian. For example, perturbation under electric field will give polarizability, perturbation under magnetic field uh, will give magnetizability, and so on and so forth. So what we need to do to get those linear, quadratic, and so on responses is we just need to truncate a few things, and assume that a few things are small. And so the next step is linearization. Let us say that our Hamiltonian uh, that the molecule has uh, is time independent. It is usually true. We simply have a form of a higher molecule, stationary in space. And then there will be some time dependent perturbation, say we've switched on the electric field. And clearly, for most realistic electric fields, it's a much smaller perturbation than the original Hamiltonian, and so we make the usual preservative assumption. Then what will happen is the potential will be uh, V plus dV, and therefore the density will be rho plus d rho, and that uh, response term will be time dependent on top of the station which was there. And there will be, as per the Runge Gross uh, theorem that I've mentioned, a mutually uh, unique relationship between those increments. So I will not go into the proof of this, but it turns out, after you plug this into DFT and work it out, that if you make the adiabatic approximation and you truncate the theory to first order, then the exchange correlation action is approximately, this derivative is approximately equal to the corresponding derivative of the exchange correlation energy which of course simplifies things enormously because quite a few of the exchange correlation functionals with decent performance are already known and we do not need to actually look for something new. And then, well, the st standard Taylor expansion for the exchange correlation potential. So what we can do, therefore, is if we are only looking for linear response, then the exchange correlation energy functionals from the time-independent series that is well developed can actually be used to approximate the full time and space dependent action function. This is an approximation, 
but it turns out to be the case if we're only looking for the linear response. And well, what we do is we introduce our perturbation and look for resonances in that linear response. And for example, for an electric field, they will correspond to vertical excitation. Performance, remarkably good. Uh, certainly on par with much more sophisticated methods in, in heart hypoxia. So excitation energies, we typically get to about 0.3 electron volts. Uh, bond lengths of excited states, that's a pretty difficult parameter to get, to unbelievable plus minus 1%. Dipole moments to pretty much chemical accuracy, vibrational frequencies, and of course, because DFT scales cubically, uh, the time-dependent DFT, it inherits the scaling of the reference method. And in fact, there are DFT techniques now which scale linearly. And so, compared to CISD and CCSD, which scale as n to the seventh, if you're unlucky, uh, cubic, quadratic, and linear scaling is, of course, a massive improvement. However, uh, there are two um, significant problems. In periodic solids, uh, it generally wouldn't work uh, because of the extended nature of those solids. And the reason it wouldn't work is the theory fails quite remarkably at charge transfer excitations. That having been said, uh, charge transfer excitations are actually quite rare. Uh, it's when you take an electron from, for example, this orbital and move it to that orbital, so somewhere in a different location in the system, so the charge is transferred as the electron is moved. Uh, and so for situations where charge transfer is not involved, uh, but for example, nitrogen, which is just plainly too small, uh, there we are, time-dependent local density, these are the excitation energies that we've got. Uh, match to the experiment uh, is pretty good. If we look at Hartree-Fox theory, uh, it's nowhere close. Or at least, well, okay, it's the right sign, but it's, it's considerably further away. And then things like multi-reference coupled cluster, single double substitutions, really, really, really expensive method, uh, get things to, well, what appears to be an even less accurate, in some cases, uh, answer. So the performance in those situations where it works uh, is actually really good. Uh, and as the next slide will show, the charge transfer excitation problem is in fact understood and solved by now. So long range corrections. The primary reason for the charge transfer excitation error is the fact that DFT exchange correlation functionals do not have correct asymptotics in Coulomb interaction. If you look at popular exchange correlation functionals uh, in their denominators, there's nothing uh, like the 1 over R. There's 1 over uh, um, R sort of divided by a number, there's 1 over R squared in a few things, um, so the asymptotic behavior of even uh, this relief, which is what really got DFT very popular in computational chemistry, it asymptotically behaves not as 1 over R, but as 1 fifth of 1 over R. So it actually underestimates the Coulomb interaction. And so what happens when we transfer the charge across the molecule is that Coulomb interaction energies get underestimated, and so the charge transfer excitation energies are wrong. Well, the obvious solution would be to try and find an exchange correlation function that actually behaves properly. Turns out, if you do that, then various other things break. Um, people tried. Uh, it would basically amount to the exact hard fork exchange. That's 1 over R. And accuracy with respect to other properties drops. So, the solution is uh, to fudge it, really. What was done is, uh, I think these people suggested it, is at short range, yeah, where uh, the asymptotic Coulomb interaction is not a problem, uh, we would have our usual DFT exchange correlation functionals, and we would flow them smoothly using something called Evald split into the correct asymptotics. So this function um, called Evald split, if you plot what it does, it amounts uh, to a very smooth interpolation between two approximations. 
So as you move along a parameter, so in this case R, uh, one approximation will be faded uh, and the other smoothly switched on. So that split is called the Evold split and multiplying these two terms by different functionals will simply create a smooth transition between them as z distance is scanned and the smoothness of this transition is controlled by this new parameter in alpha and beta controls the various asymptotics so this relief has got about a fifth of hartree fock exchange and the rest is DFT exchange uh, and it's constant then Local correlation functionals have got that behavior, so hard to dominate at infinity. Uh, and it was found that the best performance, um, well, really empirically found, is given by something called the Coulomb attenuation method, where the fraction of the hard to pop exchange, so the fraction of correct asymptotics, uh, changes with the distance. This is um, probably uh, an unjustifiable fudge fundamentally, but well, much of DFT is, is a fudge. Yes, there are various variable parameters in there, so now we have a variable function. In there. Uh, it's just a bit of uh, a more general fudge. <coughs> but it works, and if you look at the performance, the performance is pretty good. Uh, these are the excitation energies, well, just the energy levels really for that molecule I've shown in the previous slide, this one. And this is resolution of identity coupled cluster, very, very accurate method. Places these levels at those energies. And if we do plain DFT, uh, whether local or generalized gradient, you can see the energies are nowhere near. Yeah. This level is misplaced there. This level is misplaced there. Uh, yeah, yellow one is <coughs> a mile away. But this Coulomb attenuated B3 lip, you can see, matches it pretty well. Uh, even up to very high excitation. Again, <coughs> singles, doubles, coupled cluster is O n to the sevens. Can B3 lip is O n cube or even less. So massively cheaper method, which gives nonetheless a comparable accuracy. So really, whether or not you have a charge transfer excitation in the system, if you just use Coulomb attenuated DFT, you will get your excitation energies pretty well out. There are some uh, statistical analysis things here. Uh, I wouldn't go into them, but they just quantify the performance of various exchange correlation functionals for various excited states and various molecules. Uh, and that's the comparison between TDDFT and experimental data. Uh, various dye molecules, your polyaromatic systems which are covered. Uh, from the color of it you can pretty much get the vertical excitation energy. And you can see it fits reasonably well. So, time-dependent DFT, one particular strength once you've accounted for this. Now, Coulomb asymptotics is that the excitation energies are massively cheaper than mm -hmm. they would be in various post hartree fox things. Mm -hmm. so from this diagram, as you said, um, with this uh, plus minus 0 0.4 electron volt, uh, mm -hmm. and for let's say for molecules that they have low energy, this is a lot. Because it's uh, it's almost uh, for, uh, sorry twenty percent. It is yes. It's if it's a polyaromatic system, it will have low lying excitations. Uh, no magic, but coupled cluster will get that wrong as well. So in those situations where we've got uh, any kind of right to expect any accuracy, uh, it works. But you are right in the well small parameters, uh, small excitations small shielding tensors, small J-couplings, because they are small. Mm -hmm. They are small compared to the error. And so, there's nothing we can do. Uh, Time-dependent Hartree fog generally follows the same principle, except we actually don't need the Runge gross uh, equation here, because this is quantum mechanics. Our plain usual Schrodinger's equation 
Uh, our total wave function is the anti-symmetrized product of single particle wave functions, so our slated determinant, really. And then what we've got is d by dt of an individual orbital, which is now time-dependent, uh, will be minus i the Hamiltonian, where this is the Fock Hamiltonian, and this is the external potential. And the Fock Hamiltonian is that approximate Hamiltonian of one particle in the average field of all other particles that we've been talking about when we considered hartree Fock theory. So there's the kinetics term, uh, there's the nuclear, uh, I think it's inter-electron repulsion, or this is nuclear attraction term, and the Coulomb and exchange integrals that relate uh, the energy of interaction with the other electrons in the system. So, this is an effective Hamiltonian, all right, but once you've plugged it into the Schrodinger's equation for each specific orbital, it's just a Schrodinger's equation. And then, you know from spin dynamics course, I've actually derived that in the spin dynamics course, that the general solution to the Schrodinger's equation with time-independent Hamiltonian is given in terms of matrix exponentials. And if you then expand this matrix exponential in Taylor series, or take a derivative of it with respect to some perturbation, that is your linear response, uh, which can then be extracted in terms of observables. Uh, so in the absence of perturbations, uh, we'll just have our stationary solutions. So if these phi's are Hartree-Fock orbitals, uh, then they're just eigenfunctions of the Fock Hamiltonian, uh, and there we are, we just evolved with their phase. However, when we switch on our perturbation, uh, the derivative of the exponential with respect to the parameter of this perturbation is the original exponential times this Hausdorff series. Uh, this relation is a bit difficult to derive because various things don't come yet, but it's there. And so if you truncate it here, you'll have it to second order, here to first order. So what we require in practice is just the matrix of our perturbation uh, and various commutators that it has with the Fock Hamiltonian. This can also be done in DFT uh, and interestingly this can also be done for more accurate reference methods than hartree fock because the only thing you require really is the effective Hamiltonian. It could be a coupled cluster effective Hamiltonian or something like that. And if it is, so if we're using multi-configuration SCF or coupled cluster or some such more accurate formalism, there are various other names that this thing can have. Uh, it's called polarization propagator, because this is a time propagator. Equation of motion method, because well, Schrodinger's equation is an equation of motion. So this PP and EOM method, uh, methods, their primary strengths is they inherit the scaling of the reference method. So if the reference method was cheap and accurate, then they would be cheap and accurate as well. So. TDHF isn't particularly accurate because the reference method, the hartree fock is not that good. But TDDFT, as we saw in the previous slides, um, can actually be okay. And there's a picture, it's a dipole polarizability for neon uh, comparison um, between different methods. You can see that uh, time-dependent formalism gets mostly okay here. Right, so related um, to that, and this moves us into the time domain propagation proper, so we are returning from that approximation where we assumed our uh, perturbation to be something small on top of stationary solution, and we go back into the full time dependent situation. So what we've got uh, in the most general case is, of course, our Schrodinger's equation with, in general, the time dependent Hamiltonian. And as I derived in the spin dynamics lecture, that is a time-ordered exponential uh, applied to the initial condition. Uh, or, if we have sliced our Hamiltonian into piecewise constant approximation, then uh, we just have multiple such exponentials to multiply into. Now, what's important here is that this propagation is what people call unitary. That is, it preserves the norm of the wave function. And it's important to preserve it because the norm is related to the total probability. Yes, it's a sum total of probabilities of different states of the system. That has, of course, to be equal to 1 uh, for things to be physically non-contradictory. 
And so it is important to preserve the norm of the function as you move forward. Now, if H is Hermitian, then its exponential is automatically unitary, and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's preserved. However, we do have to worry about it in practical numerical calculations. Because in a practical numerical calculation, you can only get this exponential to a specific accuracy. Or you can afford to get it to a specific accuracy. And in most cases, as we'll see, certainly in quantum chemistry, you can't even afford it. So various punches have to be invented uh, to try and get matrices either a bit smaller or a bit sparser uh, or a bit more computationally friendly. So here are the three current uh, favorite methods for computing matrix exponentials. The simplest one, uh, and uh, I would make this controversial claim actually the best one in practice, uh, is Taylor. Uh, infinite convergence radius, if you've scaled it properly and then square it up, uh, it gives the least possible amount of trouble, and if the exponential is sparse, um, it actually is, it comes out as sparse. Uh, Chebyshev uh, has got some notorious numerical instabilities, uh, although I guess it will be disputed in some circles, and not uh, an infinite convergence radius, uh, which also is a worry in practice. And the primary weakness of Padet approximation, even though Padet approximations are in general much better than Chebyshev's or Taylor's, is the presence of this denominator. Uh, the need to take the inverse of a sparse matrix. Uh, whether or not it is applied to some other matrix, whether or not it's a bit cheaper as a result is inconsequential, but the problem is the inverse of a sparse matrix is usually dense, and so the memory cost of this Padet approximation is consequently much greater. So what we have in MATLAB is by default Padet, uh, spinach runs on Taylor or Chebyshev, that's a user-switchable parameter, but the default in all cases is Taylor. Now, the problem is, Given the dimensions, uh, this operation in quantum chemistry context is in most cases prohibitively expensive. Just wouldn't fit into memory. The problem can be avoided to some extent by noticing that we do not actually require the exponential as such. We need the result of its multiplication into a function. Yeah, and if this is a matrix and that's a vector, what we really fondly want is this vector, which means that what the only thing we really need to do is matrix vector multiplications, which are n squared compared to n cube scaling of matrix matrix multiplications. And so the classical Krilov trick, well, the real, real Krilov method is a bit more sophisticated than this, uh, but that gives you the, the flavor is to open up our exponential into a Taylor series and instead of taking these matrix powers and summing them together, what we do is we multiply these matrices one by one into a vector, as many times as necessary. And that avoids matrix-matrix multiplications, it avoids the uh, increase in matrix density here at the cost of um, a few more ma multiplications. So, Typically, to converge this in a well-scaled situation, you need about 15 matrix matrix multiplications. Uh, and in this case, you need a, maybe 100 matrix vector multiplications. But for large matrices, it is a, a, an excellent trade-off, because matrices are different. Uh, some simplification can be made uh, if we have operators inside our Hamiltonian which independently exponentiate well. Either the sparsity is preserved, or Fourier transforms can be used, or some such thing. And this is often the case if we have, in electronic structure theory, the kinetic energy operator and the potential energy operator. Because if we move into the coordinate representation, then the potential operator is very simple. But if we Fourier transform the problem into momentum representation, then the momentum operator is simple. Uh, and so by shuttling between these two representations with Fourier transforms, uh, the, the time propagation problem can be made con considerably simpler. But for that, reason, for that to work, we really need to split our full exponential into some function of exponentials of these individual operators. 
And that can be done based on Cantor-Baker-Hausdorff Cantor equation. And uh, generally, such integrators are called symplectic uh, integrators. And um, the advantage that it offers, it's much cheaper than exponential propagator. Uh, it does have its um, error term. But importantly, it's quite useful in physical context because it still obeys all the physical conservation laws. The reason why it's important is if you try solving Schrodinger's equation with things like runge kutta uh, or Euler, or Leapfrog, uh, or you name it, any um, numerical integration method that's been invented by mathematicians, what you immediately notice is that conservation laws are not obeyed. Energy drifts, phase drifts, momentum drifts, uh, and so the fact that mathematicians have invented them means that they obey certain nominal accuracy criteria, but they obey them in not the sort of ways that would like them to obey them. And so these symplectic integrators actually obey the conservation laws exactly, uh, but cut some corners in the exact details of, say, density distribution, or, or, in fact, in most cases, it's the phase into which the error is all packaged up. And um, depending on the orders that we, we take in Campbell Baker Hausdorff, we can um, take this error term out to different um, magnitudes. And the basic case is known as symplectic Euler, the slightly more sophisticated thing is called symplectic Verlet, uh, and so on. So, really, the primary purpose of these is to simplify. Uh, the algebra at the propagation stage, and at the same time, because we have to introduce an approximation to make sure that approximation is, uh, does as little damage to the physical uh, reality as possible. Uh, and well, here's the uh, example. If we look at just the relay, not symplectic relay, uh, and the energy is a function of time, then exponential propagation, of course, conserves the energy because it's the exact solution. And you can see that uh, the energy actually drifts uh, under uh, the uh, Verlet integrator. It's not quite clear here, uh, but that's just uh, really uh, a harmonic oscillator, which has a sinusoid, analytical solution is a sinusoid. Runge Kutta, you don't quite see it, but it diverges. Um, so it, the energy grows unphysically. Uh, and velocity relay stays pretty close, uh, and Euler, I think, gets even more wrong than wrong you could uh, Here's an indication of what happens to the phase. So if we take it even further out, red is the analytical solution, uh, so with the exact matrix exponential, and the rest are various uh, variations of symplectic methods. You can see that the phase is completely instantly. Thankfully, the phase of the wave function is in practice inconsequential because we're only really interested in the density uh, or various observables, which means the phase cancels. However, this makes symplectic integrators utterly inapplicable to nuclear magnetic resonance because we do require in our pulse sequences the system to arrive to a pulse at a specific phase because if we give an X pulse, uh, then the system that sits on the x-axis would simply be unaffected, system that sits on the y-axis will be rotated into z, and the system that sits on the z-axis will be rotated into y. So the fate of the system in the NMR power sequence critically depends on the fate. And this is why uh, it's so difficult to apply in particular the density matrix normalization group methods, because quite a few things in there have been formulated in terms of symplectic integrator. And as soon as you try doing that, uh, in an MR context, this phase error kills you completely, except in the simplest possible synthetic cases. And so when we work with NMR, unfortunately, and uh, this is uh, uh, what I'm saying, is the result of 10 years of searching, uh, the only method that really properly consistently works all the time in NMR is proper accurate matrix exponentiation, or Kirillov uh, version of matrix exponentiation. Uh, and I have tried many integrators over the years to do NMR problems, and they all lose the phase.
which brings us to dynamics. So as soon as we decided which integrator we do forward in time, the dynamics forward in electronic structure theory I have just uh, gone through. So now let's take a look at the second type that I've mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. That is the dynamics of the nuclei while we try and keep the electrons in their ground state. Uh, back to classical mechanics, uh, to Lagrange's formalism. Uh, Lagrangian will have the kinetic energy term and the potential energy term. And the kinetic energy term is just you know, the velocity of the nucleus. It's a classical situation. And the potential energy term, to make the calculation classical, we will assume, and this is where uh, the names come from, born Oppenheimer, that the electronic structure remains in its ground state. That it has enough time to relax and dissipate as the nuclei are moving around to stay in the ground state. And so the Lagrangian will have our kinetic energy and our potential energy, and the potential energy will simply come out of an ab initio calculation as the ground state energy under a particular Hamilton. If it's DFT, then it's very similar. Instead of this proper expectation value, we have our energy functional of the orbitals and the nuclear coordinates. Uh, and then it's just it. So then we plug this Lagrangian into Lagrange's equation. Uh, there it is. And we get our Newton's equation of motion, F equals ma. Uh, there's your m, there's your a uh, for each nucleus. And that's the gradient with respect to those nuclear coordinates of the potential. As you know, force in Newton's uh, equations of motion is equal to the gradient of the energy. Uh, same for density functional theory. So, in principle, the only thing we need to do is run the calculation, get the nuclear coordinate gradients. Those are now implemented analytically in most uh, electronic structure theory packages and just push this thing forward in time using either symplectic integrator or even for you know, small time stretches something basic like when you could uh, and we solve it forward in time uh, but the OMD tends to be expensive because what we need to do at every single step is to solve the entire electronic structure theory problem and differentiate that problem with respect to nuclear coordinates uh, that is not cheap but in principle, there we are. And this would be the nice kind of molecular dynamics, because if you remember, I think it was lecture two, three, when I introduced classical molecular dynamics, it had a few problems. It was a gross approximation. Uh, it couldn't treat bond breaking, it got its charges wrong, and it had quite a few other limitations. Uh, this is ab initio molecular dynamics. The fact that nucleus is a classical mass is a pretty decent approximation. And the motion of those nuclei is then controlled by quantum mechanical processes as the molecule vibrates or moves or something else happens in it. And bond breaking can be treated easily because it is accommodated inside this calculation, assuming that the calculation of a sufficiently high level to actually accommodate. But it's expensive. So the less expensive alternative is to evolve forward not just the nuclei, uh, and recompute the potential as we go, but also some representation of the electronic structure. So, a modified Lagrangian uh, that turned out in practice to be cheaper, uh, even if less physically uh, elegant perhaps, was suggested by Carr and Parinella, and it became known as the Carr Parinella molecular dynamics. So, we still have our Lagrangian. And it's got the nuclear kinetic energy term, just like the previous Lagrangian did. Uh, it has the potential energy term, just like the previous Lagrangian did. But what it also now has is the electron kinetic energy. And because the electrons are so light, uh, to keep them uh, moving a little bit slow, a fictitious mass is attached to each electron. Uh, chosen, uh, really empirically based on the ease of integration and the practical accuracy. And then we've got uh, the action term coming here, which simply enforces orbital orthogonality. 
and that is it becomes zero if the orbitals are maintained in the orthogonal state. Uh, well, there's your Lagrange's equation, and whereas previously we had our Lagrange's equation in terms of nuclear velocities and nuclear coordinates, we now have um, two Lagrange's equations, one with respect to velocities and coordinates, and the other with respect to the electron orbitals and the electron orbital derivatives. So, crunching through uh, this Lagrangian gives us a set of coupled differential equations for the velocity of the nuclei, the acceleration of the nuclei, and the acceleration of the electron orbitals in here. So, as I said, the mass of electrons is fictitious, but the greatest practical advantage of this method is it does not require one to recompute and reconverge the entire electronic structure theory every time a step is taken, because electrons are co-evolving with the nuclei, and it is cheaper. However, um, it's not very physical, and in order to keep it physical, what is absolutely essential is that the electron state, although dynamic, doesn't stray particularly far from the ground state. In other words, the electron subsystem must be kept as cold as possible. Uh, and if we freeze it down, you know, to a couple of Kelvin, then it really would be close to the actual ground electronic state. And then the Carcarinella trajectory would be a good representation of the Born-Oppenheimer trajectory. And hopefully the error wouldn't be all that large. So the exchange of energy between the nuclear degrees of freedom, which can be quite hot, because let's say we're tearing the molecule apart, uh, and the electron degrees of freedom should be minimal. And if that is the case, then our Carcarinella energy will be approximately equal to our Born-Oppenheimer energy, and this is what we want. It turns out in practice that in order to achieve that isolation between the nuclear and the uh, electron energy reservoirs, they shouldn't have any frequencies in common. Uh, that is, if on the energy spectrum of either subsystem you do have overlapping frequencies, then the energy transfer will become resonant, and will become very efficient. And so, so long as the spectra are kept separate, there is little energy transfer in there. Now, the simplest way to do it is to make all the frequencies associated with the electrons as large as possible. Because really, nuclear frequencies are usually in the infrared. Uh, electron frequencies are typically in the ultraviolet. And infrared is pretty far from the ultraviolet. And if you reduce the fictitious mass, you'll push the electrons away further. But the problem is, if you reduce the fictitious mass, the frequencies go up, the time step has to go down, because you need to reproduce those frequencies in the actual calculation. Uh, Nyquist condition, really, another variety. So there's a balance to be struck between the expense of the Carpernella method, it's much cheaper than born Oppenheimer, and the resulting accuracy. The more accurate you make it, the more expensive it becomes. Uh, and one other um, perhaps philosophical issue with it is you can see there's quite a few things to worry about in covering a method. You need to worry about the energy transfer, you need to worry about your fictitious masses, you need to see whether it's a good representation of what you want to do. Uh, Born Oppenheimer method, on the contrary, is just a black box. Yeah, as soon as you've chosen the electronic structure theory, it just works, assuming that you've uh, done your programming correctly. And so there are two significant school of, schools of thought in the area. Uh, part of the community has accepted Carpernella method uh, and is using it quite joyously. The other part really sticks to Born Oppenheimer and say that really because the nuclei don't move too much per step, you really, the previous instance of your electronic stress theory calculation is actually pretty close to the new one and makes a decent initial guess. And if you start from that initial guess, it will converge pretty quickly. So the efficiency gain, maybe if you look at it, isn't all that large, but the headaches disappear. So it is your choice, ultimately. Uh, I'm in the born Oppenheimer camp because I just instinctively dislike any sort of fudge, uh, however well-founded, uh, but, uh, as I said, measure of personality. So, cho choosing the time step. So, 
the smaller the time step, the more accurate it becomes. So Nyquist condition, uh, you need two points per period of the fastest oscillation, uh, even if you're doing things extremely accurately. But on the other hand, uh, well, we don't have this problem here in Southampton because our supercomputing time is free. But back in Oxford, I was charged for every clock uh, that I was using. And really, this adds up quite quickly. We were going through about 5,000 pounds worth of CPU time per year uh, back at the Oxford Supercomputing Center. Uh, and there's the fluctuation in the kinetic energy. You can see the multiplier is pretty small, uh, corresponding to different uh, values of um, I think this is whether or not the thermostat in there, so whether or not you are keeping the uh, system at a specific temperature uh, for a given fictitious mass and a given time step. So, if you have a very long trajectory, uh, the error tends to accumulate as the trajectory gets longer, so you need a more accurate calculation, therefore a smaller fictitious mass. Uh, sometimes, depends on what you do, could it increase the nuclear mass, but that would just amount to rescaling the time eventually uh, if you increase the mass uniformly. Uh, maybe switch on the thermostat, which essentially just slows down electron dynamics, introduces some friction in the electron subsystem to keep it as cold as possible. Uh, and really, because there's no orbital dynamics in born up and Heimer, the frequencies intrinsic in the born up and Heimer Lagrangian are much smaller, yeah, because you don't treat the electrons. And so born up and method allows you to take much longer steps as a result, although, as I said, the steps can sometimes be expensive. Uh, the reason why Caparina is used at all, uh, much cheaper forces, so the OMD force, as already mentioned, is the gradient of the full electronic structure series calculation, whereas CPMD forces are, are uh, well, these are really trivially simple, uh, and this is uh, the nuclear gradient of the exchange correlation potential. Uh, it's also cheaper than doing this whole work. So, bottom line about Caparinella, keep the electron temperature low, make sure it doesn't increase, and make sure the time steps that you've chosen conserves the total energy, uh, because if the time step is too small, uh, is too large, then that would increase the case. Final slide uh, to illustrate uh, the point about non overlapping uh, the, uh, electron and nuclear spectrum. Uh, this is, uh, what was it? I think it's the, yeah, it's the vibrational density of states, I think, in nitrogen, um, something simple. Uh, but you see, it's in terahertz. So infrared frequency, and so long as the electron frequencies are kept away from this, the calculation should be fine. That's the timing. Uh, the reason why uh, born up and Heimer uh, can sometimes lose out. Uh, Carparinella, although it requires a much smaller time step, uh, conserves the energy to much greater accuracy than the born up and Heimer, uh, and if you try relaxing the convergence requirements on the electronic structure theory, really things get pretty bad, you start losing the energy accuracy pretty quickly. Uh, and that's the difference between Carparinella and a, a well-converged uh, BOMD. You see there's no difference really, it's uh, quite tiny, it's 10 times 10 to the minus 4, but then again this isn't uh, a very long so the errors become progressively greater as you move further into the future. Okay, um, that's it for today and from the next lecture we'll move into magnetic properties.